Hello guys, we are going further today. We're talking about um, photochemical oxidants and photochemical smog and all kinds of fun things. Um, this one will be a little bit longer than yesterday's lecture, so bear with me. Um, so to start, photochemical oxidants, this is just when sunlight acts on certain compounds that we talked about in our previous lecture like nitrogen oxide and sulfur, ox sulfur dioxide. Um, like we said, they are harmful to plant tissue, human respiratory tissue, and construction materials, so they can damage buildings and people and plants. Um, ozone, O3, is the most abundant photochemical oxidant in the troposphere. It's harmful to plants and animals, causes asthma and emphysema. Um, and the way that we can remember this is that it's good when it's up really high, but it's bad when it's nearby. So you can kind of see in this little graphic down here at the bottom. Um, sometimes people can get confused because um, right now we're listing ozone as a photochemical oxidant, which is a bad thing, right? It's harmful, um, which is true. But that's when it's down here in the troposphere with us. When um, we talk about, oh, there's a hole in the ozone layer and that's a bad thing. Um, that's going to be up here further away from us, and that's what's protecting us from a lot of the sun's rays. So important to keep in mind, and a good little rhyme there, good up high, bad nearby, when you're thinking about ozone. Um, so when you burn coal and oil, um, it does lead to industrial smog, and we talk often about how dangerous it can be, oh, well, how dangerous it is, really, to uh, burn fossil fuels in general. Um, but in this case, we're talking particularly about how it um, can lead to industrial smog. So ozone, that O3 we just talked about, reacts when it's in the presence of VOCs and nitrous oxide. VOCs are volatile organic compounds, remember, to form even more harmful oxidants. And so in the presence of sulfur and nitrogen oxide, ozone enhances the formation of particulate matter that scatters light. So it's almost like ozone is acting like a catalyst um, when it's in the presence of sulfur and nitrogen oxide. And that particulate matter that's already there, it uh, forms even more, even more frequently and can cause uh, the light to be scattered, which is what starts looking like smog. So smog is a mixture of oxidants and particulate matter. So those oxidants that we just mentioned, as well as particles. So photochemical smog is broken down into two different types. You've got, um, oh, I'm sorry, smog is broken down into two types. You've got photochemical and sulfurous smog. Photochemical smog is also sometimes called Los Angeles type smog. And this is mostly composed of oxidants like ozone. So that's going to be over here on the left. It's normally got this brown hue to it, which is why it's sometimes called brown smog. Um, on the other hand, sulfurous smog, um, also called London type smog or gray smog, is mostly sulfur dioxide and sulfate compounds. So that one's got a more grayish hue to it as opposed to the brown of the Los Angeles type smog. Um, an atmospheric brown cloud is a combination of particulate matter um, and ozone derived primarily from a combustion of fossil fuels and biomass. So a case study on this um, that exists is the South Asian brown clouds, melting glaciers, and atmospheric cooling. Um, a 2008 UNEP study on the South Asian brown clouds. Basically, it caused the gradual gradual melting of Himalayan glaciers. Um, the particles absorb sunlight and warm air above the glaciers and then reflect some sunlight back to space. And so overall, it, cool, it had a cooling effect on the Earth's atmosphere. Um, this in particular does affect the west coast of the United States. So major outdoor air pollutants, we already talked about this a little bit when we talked about um, the different 
uh, compounds that are most legislated in the Clean Air Act of 1970. Um, but some of the things that we have, you've got lead, mercury, and then um, VOCs. So we'll talk about each of those. So lead is going to come from things like oil, gasoline, coal, and paint. It impairs the central nervous system. It affects your learning and concentration. Children are the most vulnerable to um, lead poisoning. I'm sure you've heard about recalls with things like um, paint or antique. You have to be careful with antique children's toys or um, bassinets or uh, what are baby beds called? Cradles, things like that, because um, if they're antique, then there's a chance that they have lead paint on them. Um, it can cause death, mental handicaps, and paralysis. Worldwide, 15 to 18 million children have brain damage due to lead poisoning. You've also got mercury. This can come from oil, coal, and gold mining. Again, it can impair the central nervous system. And this is something that bioaccumulates in the food chain, which is that bioaccumulation is something that we've talked about already um, last month, I believe. So VOCs um, are another major outdoor pollutant. Um, organic compounds that become vapors at typical atmospheric temperature. So basically room temperature, they turn to a vapor. They turn to a, ga turn to a gas. Um, this is going to be things like the evaporation of fuel, solvents, paints, or when there's improper combustion. So um, something is burned incorrectly. They give off pretty strong odors. It's a precursor to ozone. And it is not considered a criteria air pollutant, which means that this is not one of the ones that is um, regulated by the Clean Air Act. Um, actually, I want to go a little bit more into detail on that. So, well, we might go into it later when we go to indoor air pollutants. But um, VOCs are interesting because they're in building materials and fuels and machinery, yeah, um, but when it comes to things inside of your house as well, I know we're talking about outdoor right now, but inside your house, um, a lot of building materials have VOCs in them, especially note that it says comp composite wood products. So let's say you order um, a new desk or something from Ikea or from, you know, wherever, and it's made of plywood, it's got plywood in it, then a lot of times plywood and maybe even the caulk that's in it um, or preservatives that are in the wood, those are going to be releasing fumes um, while it's in your home. And so I was telling students in class today, um, that's why I'm very particular about which house plants I choose and even plants in the classroom because I like to pick ones that specifically are good at removing VOCs in the household or classroom. Um, so primary pollutants and secondary pollutants. Primary pollutants um, come directly out of a smokestack, exhaust pipe, or natural emission source. So this is going to be things like what comes out of your car's tailpipe, um, what comes out of smokestacks at large industries, what comes out of a volcano, things like that, straight from the source. Honestly, it's easy to think about this, like if you're thinking about primary and secondary sources, like maybe in an English class or a journalism class. Meanwhile, secondary pollutants have undergone transformations in the presence of sunlight, water, oxygen, or other compounds. So um, secondary, right? It's just not straight from the source. It's undergone a transformation somehow. These don't occur as rapidly at night because of the lack of energy from the sun or in dry environments due to lack of water. Some examples of secondary pollutants are ozone um, and things like that. So we also have to mention the um, natural emissions that occur. So we've mentioned volcanoes, forest fires, things like that. Um, volcanoes can release sulfur dioxide, they can release um, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxide. They can also create acid rain after an eruption. <clears throat> and additionally, lightning strikes can create nitrogen oxide because of atmospheric CO2. Nope, sorry, atmospheric nitrogen. Forest fires, again, they're going to re release particulate matter, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides. Um, some living plants do release VOCs. I know that might be kind of confusing because I just said that I like to pick plants that 
absorb them. But living plants um, can release VOCs because um, it depends on what kind of plant they are, right? In a video that we watched today in class, they talk about um, how pine trees, you know, you, you buy a fresh Christmas tree and it smells so good. It smells like pine, right? Um, but those smells are considered VOCs. And so that natural smog is how the Blue Ridge and the Smoky Mountains got their names, fun fact. And then additionally, large-scale agriculture can release a lot of particulate matter during plowing. Think of the Dust Bowl. I don't really like that this is included under natural emissions because that's got human impact in that one, but we'll take it. Um, anthropogenic emissions, remember anthro means human, so in this case human-caused emissions. Human emissions are pretty heavily monitored, regulated, and I don't know, controls, controlled is a strong word, but they are monitored and regulated by the EPA. Um, vehicles are the largest source of carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxides in our atmosphere, so transportation. And then the production of electricity um, by burning coal is the largest producer of sulfur dioxide. And then particulate matter comes from fires, road dust, and also that electricity generation. So the Clean Air Act, which we've already mentioned briefly, um, requires the EPA to establish standards to control pollutants that are harmful to human health and welfare. Um, so this means elderly people, children, and sensitive populations like people with asthma or COPD or other respiratory issues. And then welfare refers to visi visibility, status of crops, natural veg vegetation, animals, ecosystems, and buildings. So um, ideally, it's supposed to look at its impact on humans as a whole. So there are some other laws and regulations about air quality. You've got the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. These specify the concentration limits for six outdoor criteria air pollutants. Um, and as of right now, only ozone and particulate matter regularly exceed the set limits. So for the most part, the other six that they, or the, the out of the six total that they monitor, um, and they set concentration limits for only ozone and particulate matter are breaking those limits frequently. Um, lead has really gone down significantly once we realized the effect it was having on children especially. Um, if city violates limits averaged over a three-year period and does not make attempts to improve their quality, they can be subject to fines or barred from receiving federal funds. So it is taken pretty seriously. Um, some of the most polluted cities... Um, You've got the Black Triangle is the most polluted area in the world because of the use of high sulfur coal. This is going to be Germany, Poland, and the Czech Republic. It has resulted in human health problems like higher re cases of respiratory illness and forest ecosystem damage. You also got Shanghai. Um, China generally dominate, dominates the list of most polluted cities. And visibility could be reduced by as much as 20% because of particulate matter and sulfur oxides. And while it has gotten better in some areas, photochemical smog is still an environmental issue um, in the U.S. So photochemical smog and ozone are still air quality issues here. The EPA reported in 2010 that 50 regions in the U.S. did not comply with maximum allowable ozone concentration. So you can see Huntsville looks okay. Birmingham not looking great over here. So just to kind of go over again how this happens, volatile organic compounds plus nitrogen oxides, heat, sunlight, all of those things combine and they turn into ozone, um, nitrogen oxide, organic compounds, carbon dioxide and water. So ozone production and breakdown. But when VOCs get involved, the ozone doesn't have a chance to break down. Um, atmospheric temperature does influence the formation of photochemical smog. So VOC evaporation increases with temperature. The higher the vapor pressures, the lower the flashpoints, and the plants release at a faster rate. Nitrogen oxide emissions from power plants increase on hot days because people are demanding more electricity. 
and the rate of chemical reactions increases as temperatures increase, which we, we hopefully remember that from chemistry. Now, thermal inversion, we talked about this briefly with the last unit, but basically um, when a relatively warm layer of air at mid-altitude covers a layer of cold, dense air below, that warmer, less dense air moves in over a cooler, denser air mass. And then radiation from the surface of the Earth exceeds the amount of radiation received from the sun. So you can see normal conditions in the graph and then thermal inversion conditions in the graph there. <clears throat> so in China in 1998, um, the city's central heat shut down. And this led to many households using coal burning stoves. And over a thousand people suffered carbon monoxide poisoning or respiratory ailments, and 11 died. And it was because of that carbon monoxide that was being released from their stoves. So indoor air pollution, um, this causes more deaths each year than outdoor air pollution. And 90% of deaths attributed to indoor air pollution are in developing countries. Um, so in developing countries, indoor burning of wood, charcoal, dung, crop residues, and coal. So really burning anything indoors without good ventilation um, is very dangerous in regard to the air quality. And in developed countries, indoor air pollution is greater than outdoor air pollution, which might surprise you. And the reason why is that 11 of the common air pollutants are higher inside than outside. It's greater in vehicles than outside. And the health risks are magnified. People spend 70 to 98 percent of their time indoors or in cars so we're not outside as much this is a pretty serious problem um children under five and the elderly are at high risk sick people pregnant women people with respiratory disorders or heart problems smokers factory workers and then there's also it also increases the risk of respiratory infections pneumonia bronchitis and cancer so that would be interesting to kind of look at the effects that quarantining for coronavirus has had on people's health in the U.S. because we haven't been able to get outside um, and get some fresh air um, as much as we usually would. So when, when you hear someone say, like, oh, you need to get outside, you need to get some fresh air, they're probably right. Um, four most dangerous indoor air pollutants are carbon monoxide. VOCs like formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is commonly used as a preservative in a lot of um, plywood and other types of compressed woods like that. Radioactive radon gases and very small particles like asbestos. And then other indoor air pollutants that aren't quite as dangerous um, or common. Tobacco smoke, pesticide residue, um, PB, I believe that's lead, lead particles, living organisms in their excrement, so dust mites and cockroach droppings, and then airborne spores of molds and mildews. So if I were you, I'd take a second, pause this, um, and look at these different important indoor air pollutants that you might want to be aware of. I won't insult your intelligence by going through and reading all of them, but... Definitely familiarize yourself. Um, asbestos is a long, thin, fibrous silicate material with insulating properties. Um, people who mined asbestos, who um, collected it from the earth, um, have really high rates of asbestosis, which is a scarring of the lungs caused by the fibers that were inhaled. Lung cancer, mesothelioma, and pleural thickening. Insulating materials are only dangerous if they begin to come apart and the fibers are inhaled. And asbestos is no longer used in the U.S. and removal has to be done under extremely controlled conditions to make sure that all the fibers are captured and they can't be inhaled. Radon-222 is colorless, odorless, and is produced by the natural radioactive decay of U-238. This damages lung tissue and can lead to lung cancer. Actually, 15% of lung cancer deaths come from people who have been exposed to radon-222. Living areas should be monitored for two months, and it can be remedied by sealing cracks and increasing ventilation. 
So you can kind of see the breakdown of how that happens here. Sick building syndrome. This is wild. Um, so buildings that are more tightly sealed and insulated allow toxic compounds and pollutants to build up in airtight spaces. So if you've got high levels of VOCs, hydrocarbons, and other compounds, this can lead to things like headaches, nausea, throat or eye irritation, and fatigue. Um, so if you're in a brand new building and it's tightly sealed and very well insulated, that could lead to something like this happening. Four reasons for sick building syndrome, as identified by the EPA, are inadequate or faulty ventilation, chemical contamination from glues, carpet, furniture, cleaners, and coffee machines, outdoor chemical contamination being brought indoors through the ventilation, and then biological contamination from indoors or outdoors in the form of mold or pollen. So again, get outside, get some fresh air. It is good for you. Um, some of the solutions, or a small solution really, to some of these issues, um, things like banning indoor smoking, stricter formaldehyde emission standards for carpet, furniture, and building materials. So many carpets and composite woods and things like that release formaldehyde in the air. Crazy. Prevent radon infiltration and use less pollutant polluting cleaning agents, paints, and other products. So instead, you're going to want to use efficient venting systems, circulated buildings air through rooftop greenhouses. You know, I love that idea. That's awesome. Circulate the air more frequently and use adjustable fresh air vents for workspaces. Just some ideas there. So pollution prevention we're going to get into um, later on in the week, but a lot to think about for this one. Um, if you have any questions, email me the student notes. Oh, excuse me. The student notes are in today's folder along with the slideshow and um, your case study for today as well. So if you need anything at all, just email me and let me know.